History is filled with almosts. Those who were almost a good Batman. But for them, it proved too much. And then there were the others, the ones who embrace the moment and commit. A shed load of cash. But for mere mortals, just like you and me, well, me, anyway, we whisper six simple words. Fortune favors the Crypto Culture Show. Hello and welcome to the show. If the prospect of becoming a new you in 2022 means changing your crypto Twitter profile pic, then this is the show for you. Joining me this week is Canada's answer to John Doe. It's Canada's John Doe. <laughs> and all the way from Geneva in Switzerland, it's Alex Polterak. And you might have noticed he doesn't have a background. That's because uh, our backgrounds didn't pass his security checks. Uh, being a cold storage expert. Alex, welcome to the show. Welcome hey. to the show, guys. How are you both doing? Good, good. Thanks. Nice to meet you all. Let's get straight into the show and start with the headlines. Now. Okay, and we start the headlines with news from Kazakhstan, which has uh, been dominating over here in the UK with the authorities shutting down web and mobile communication and the Bitcoin mining rate dropping. Now, Alex, you're from Russia, so this is a little closer to home uh, for you. What are your views on this? Yeah, so first of all, on the on the hash rate being uh, having dropped, uh, I haven't noticed that. On the uh, hash rate graphs, you can see that it's uh, actually all time high for the Bitcoin's hash rate. So we haven't really noticed the, the drop. Apparently, the, the miners at least still had access to the internet. And you should know that to, to commit a block, you only need to, to send a very little amount of information. Um, on the political side, uh, Kazakhstan was and still always uh, a kind of a political polygon where Russia tests uh, political um, ways to, to influence politics before it gets to, to Russia. Uh, and speaking with my parents uh, recently about this situation and Russia involvement, uh, they told me, oh, it's kind of obvious uh, Russia is defending its asset, which is uh, their main asset in Kazakhstan is uh, Baikonur uh, Cosmodrome. So probably very much linked with this and not willing the Americans to be first to, to occupy this, uh, this uh, asset. Very interesting. There we go. Somebody in the know with um, a very different perspective and point of view. Thank you, Alex. Uh, John, over in Canada, what have you got for us this week? Is it something around uh, an open sea competitor? Yes, NFTs. It looks like 2022 just started, and that is what is um, the word on the street. Right now, we had an, a competitor to OpenSea called Looks Rare. They did launch a little bit different than um, OpenSea, and they did a huge airdrop for anyone who has used OpenSea. And based on your volume that you, you actually use, I think it's about two, uh, three Ethereum or so, you will get a Looks airdrop uh, for the token, which is around $5 right now, and it has been doing pretty well. And then other than that, we've had the Australian Open, is also jumping into the metaverse with NFTs. So I think we're, we're, we're off to a good start for 2022 for NFTs. I don't think uh, we're going to slow down here in the new year, and there will be lots more to come. Indeed. And not that I would say this, but some might. The Australian Open in terms of tennis might be a poor cousin to uh, Wimbledon, the US Open, and the French Open. So they're stealing a little march on their competitors with an NFT launch and the news about Novak. Um, they certainly put themselves in the spotlight. For sure. Very good. And we just finished the headlines on um, a guy in San Francisco who has hacked his Tesla to be able to mine Bitcoin. He looks very happy with himself. Um, he might not be so happy when he finds out his warranty is voided. 
Uh, but hey, maybe when Tesla start accepting Bitcoin as payment, they'll uh, they'll give him a pass. So. Yeah, that's what he says. Honestly, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure it's profit. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, it, it may be mining rewards, but I'm not sure it's profit. Yeah. Okay, it's time to get really graphic now. Don't worry, it's not about to go all not safe for work. I just mean this next bit has got some graphs in. <laughs> And now we're going to have a look at the market. So over to you, John. What have you got? Well, we're now almost two weeks into 2022. And if you've thought of buying the Bitcoin dip starting off the year, I don't think it's been uh, going very good for everyone. But we're getting our first buy the dip opportunity, possible reversal now. And I'm going to show you first here on the daily chart. And then we'll talk about the momentum. So right here, I have Bitcoin's daily chart pulled up. And right here is where we ended off 2021. And as you can see, the year has been trending downwards. But if you look at the, uh, where the price found this bottom right here, we just might be reversing to the first potential good buy to dip entry uh, towards pushing towards that next resistance level. If we look back towards September when we had that last uh, previous major correction, price came down to that 40,000 level. And that's exactly what we got this time around. And as well, if you look at the RSI, is oversold. The MACD is also coming with a bullish crossover for Bitcoin. So what I'm expecting now is price to have a, a reversal, heading up to test its first resistance up here at about 46 to 48,000. And if we can, we most likely will see a little bit of a rejection at that level, and then the, the retest either to the lows or break out and flip that level into a support, bringing us to that next level up or at around 55,000 here as that next major resistance for 2022 and then bitcoin will start will officially actually be in an uptrend for the beginning of the year all right so there is my chart analysis what do you think about that tom i know the on-chain data as well is potentially pointing to a bottom for bitcoin um the open interest is extremely high and given the price has been dropping that is probably more shorts than longs so we may be in for a short squeeze and some price volatility in the near future. Uh, very interesting. Keep our eye on that. And like you say, could be our first good buy the dip opportunity. Oh, yeah. Thanks, John. And we will, of course, have more chart analysis and on-chain data next week. Our guest today is an expert in cold storage and has some interesting views on Web3. And in my good book, that is enough to make them a crypto god. <laughs> Alex, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to have you on. Uh, now, I just want to start by um, getting a little bit of background from you about what you do. I know you've got a company set up called Hodling SA that manages um, very, very secure storage for people who own lots of Bitcoin. But just give us a quick bit of background about yourself and about your company. So I'm Alexander Poltrak. I work in the crypto space since uh, probably five years now. Uh, worked at a crypto broker before, and uh, we co-founded uh, Hodling SA last year in March. And so we help our customers to set up uh, multi-signature uh, wallets based on different uh, vendors' hardware wallets, uh, based on hardware wallets from different vendors. So it's very, very secure cold storage solutions. So this I was just going to say is if I've got, say, over 100 Bitcoin, I would need more than one wallet to access my Bitcoin at any given time. Is that correct? Yeah. So in order not to trust a single manufacturer, you would spread the, the setup in several uh, signers uh, being from different vendors. So that's uh, on like uh, reducing your level of trust into one single manufacturer. But there are also other um, advantages, like for example, you have you can have multiple people in a company uh, signing for a transaction. You can also spread these different keys over different jurisdiction to make a legal seizure much more complicated. So it's way more resilient. In, in some ways, sort of decentralizing cold storage yeah yeah and um and sort of talking of decentralization and putting 
the power back into the user's hands. Um, we, we mentioned Web3 earlier. It's obviously uh, a very current buzzword. What's your take on Web3 at the moment? Yeah, so currently it's it's definitely a buzzword. So first we need to, to see what was the problem with Web2 and what is the promise of Web3 and where it actually is. So Web2, Web1 was decentralized uh, web where everyone was supposed to have a server and was also a client. And so you, you are at the same time server and client and uh, consume uh, content in a peer-to-peer -peer way. Web2 centralized this into platforms uh, like Facebook, Google, whatever. Uh, and Web3 promises to decentralize it again and give access to, to the people, to their own information. In fact, what we see now is that the Web3 wallet is a very centralized wallet that uh, uses some server to access the peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. So for now, it's more of a buzzword. The intention is good, uh, but uh, yeah, we we have a long road uh, to go for now. And I guess as well, you know, there's there's a big push on decentralization within the blockchain space. But I, I presume I don't know what your views on this are, but I presume that at some point in the future we have to balance some level of centralization with decentralization. And at the moment, we're trying to find our feet in terms of where that is. Is that your perspective on that as well? Or what do you think? So for now, it's still much easier to use centralized services, definitely. And this is why they're prospering. Um, but the the Bitcoin white paper, it's, it's just nine pages. But if you read only the abstract, which is one single paragraph, it clearly lays down that in order to, to benefit from decentralization, from censorship resistance and un unconfiscability, I cannot pronounce this word, um, an ability to confiscate your, your coins yeah. uh, from the, um, all the other benefits that uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain technology kind of unleashed. In order to, to have them, you need to run your own node, you need to access the, the network in a peer-to-peer -peer way and to be self-custodial, mm. meaning keeping your own keys for yourself. Mm. So Web3 is for now far from, from being this. With Bitcoin, we had uh, several, let's say, waves of uh, recentralization, like with MTGOX probably the first time when uh, approximately 80% of the circulating supply was on MTGOX. We all know how badly it finished. So it goes in waves where you, you kind of need something bad to happen, like empty gox to, to remind people the reason for decentralization in the first place. Now, the, um, the founder of Signal, Matthew Rosenfeld, Moxie. he's also known as Moxie, he says in his blog, that one of the surprising things about Web3, despite being built on crypto, is how little cryptography seems to be involved. Um, what, what does he mean by that? Well, so cryptography is used in peer-to-peer in -peer networks in, in many, many, many different ways. And one is, for example, the DHT, distributed hashtag table, uh, to... Um, road from a peer to another peer so that you can discover the road from one um, node to another node and this is uh, probably what is uh, still absolutely not used in, in web3 like most web3 software or whatever you call them that you use today is uh, a software running on your computer or your laptop connecting to a server, to a very centralized server, which connects you to the peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. Because uh, doing peer-to-peer -peer from your phone would be more battery consuming, would be more complicated to use, would use more bandwidth. In all aspects, it's, it's more complicated and more expensive. 
So this is why uh, real cryptographers, they are quite uh, deceived for now uh, on Web3. For me, anyway, the interesting thing about this whole space is, is we have several big talking points, you know, at the moment with Web3 being one, decentralization being another, speed and optimization being another. And as they get thrown at the industry, I guess what we're looking at is the, the, the beginnings of technology innovation in response to challenges and, and obstacles that the sort of blockchain or crypto is meeting uh, out in the real world. Uh, Alex, I want to say a big thank you for for your input and your views on that today. Time now to raid our digital piggy bank and tip out our coin of the week. This week's chosen crypto is Polkadot. Polkadot is a platform, so they say, for Web3, and um, its aim is to enable a completely decentralized web where users are in control. What does it do? It basically allows interoperability between blockchains um, and allows blockchains to push information and transactions in a trustless way via their relay chain. Uh, behind it is the evangelical co-founder of Ethereum, Gavin Wood. And as we mentioned before, I think very interesting for this year, given that Web3 and decentralization are certainly going to be two of the topics we will be talking about. Um, Alex, just over to you. What are your views on Polkadot? Well, honestly, I'm not a big fan of Polkadot because to me it looks a little bit over-engineered. There are many ways to, to solve this interoperability issue. And I'm more fan of uh, what's called atomic swap approach to interoperability between different blockchains. It's lighter, it's faster, and it relies only on cryptography, while Polkadot relay, rely on cryptography, but also on what's called crypto, uh, crypto finance or, let's say, economic incentives to follow the protocol. And it's it's a little bit really complicated. Mm. And just out of interest, what other chains use atomic swaps um, that are out there at the moment? Are there competitors that are doing it in in your view in a better way? So uh, so it's not chains; it's software that in, uh, that helps users to interact between existing chains. So instead of, for example, mm. interacting between Ethereum and Bitcoin via another chain which is Polkadot that makes things complicated by adding a third chain where you have security on all three of these different chains it will be interacting directly between Ethereum and Bitcoin through some peer-to-peer -peer software but just between the participants mm. no blockchain for for this very good John any views yeah like to Alex's point he makes it makes sense for Polkadot from a trader's point of view, yes, riding the yeah. price action, that looks good. But in terms of development, like Polkadot, I remember seeing the private sale a few years ago. It was, it's been lingering around, and then now it's where it's popping off. They've, they've raised a lot of capital, but the development, that's what's kind of holding it back right now. If you see, it's part of the top 10, I think, cryptos. But the development yeah. for actually what it's supposed to do is not there yet, even though they do have the resources. So I think... There's more of a technical issue there. And like atomic swaps, I remember back in 2017, there was when we had all those other chains, privacy chains and things like that, they were trying to come up with that solution. But now we got things like Uniswap. So that kind of, I think that kind of delayed it because most people, it's easier to just use something like Uniswap versus uh, actually developing something like atomic swaps for blockchains. But Uniswap so yeah, is still Polkadot, I do on blockchain. It's still within yeah. Ethereum within 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 one so people yeah. can think you can use like wrapped you can use a wrapped token wrapped btc on ethereum but it's not actually switching from uh, ethereum's blockchain to, uh, to bitcoin's uh, blockchain so, so i think that is are, something that now we are getting tech we need to get into it's good so you you yeah. mentioned the wrapped <laughs> coin to wrap a coin you yeah. need some kind of bridge between the two blockchains and this bridge can be permissioned or permissionless 
most of them for now are permissions. So you trust someone with your wrapped coin to, to be able to unwrap yeah. them and to get the original coin. Yeah, definitely. And I think as we've said on previous shows as well, there's this balance between um, development and, you know, doing things in the right way and taking your time and speed and deployment and, yeah. you know, feedback and users and innovation. So, um, you know, Kadana, I know last year, I think had the largest amount of development out of any of the top uh, blockchains, but obviously has been slow to release stuff. Now it might catch up, or it might get left behind because it's not being quick enough. And I think, you know, to your point there, Alex, uh, we will see over the next couple of years how these things play out um, and who gets traction and who doesn't. Yeah, that's the thing with the with the blockchains right now. Certain ones have to choose what's the priority, security or to scale, decent, uh, decentralization, things like that. It's because if you, if you do have a blockchain and it's not actually decentralized, not a lot of security. If a hack happens on it, then yeah, all, it wipes out a lot of money. And I feel yeah. like, like he, Alex mentioned earlier in the show, that is like a lesson that teaches a space, okay, what is the right direction to go with the uh, development of things? Exactly. All right. As always, we'll have another coin next week. Now, the spreading of fear, uncertainty, or doubt, or FUD over crypto is on the rise. It's COFUD, if you will. COFUD? Really? Okay, time to get treble jabbed and pull up your mask for... So leading the FUD pack this week is Conservative MP Richard Holden, who's been calling for crypto to be regulated like gambling. Uh, there are growing calls for tougher regulation across NFTs and cryptocurrencies in 2022 because of concerns they could prove dangerous for vulnerable people. Uh, the MP uh, in question compared crypto to the Wild West uh, and said it could quite easily and sensibly be considered gambling. Uh, now, there are, uh, as we know, some shady happenings within the NFT world um, in terms of wash trading and other things. Um, and it does feel like this year we are going to have talk and probably more action around regulation. Uh, just coming over to you, Alex, is that what you feel at the moment as well? Yeah, but I'm not too much concerned. So first of all, uh, regulators have to be pragmatic because now it's it starts to sign to sound like in '94, calling the internet a place for terrorists. There are already many companies who who are First in crypto, many businesses depend entirely on, on cryptocurrency. There are tons of different cryptocurrencies like payment tokens, utility tokens, security tokens that, for example, tokenize shares of companies. I don't think all of this is gambling and trying to pass some stupid laws like completely forbid uh, cryptocurrencies will will not go anywhere. So I'm not very much afraid of this. I think also some regulation is good. I mean, in, in like uh, democratic countries, usually regulations are meant to protect investors in this area. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not very much concerned. John, how do you see this? Yeah, like for crypto regulation right now, it seems like something that's so like wide. There's different things you can regulate, but you can't regulate the whole thing. So, like, he, um, let's say for Uniswap or NFTs, things like that that are more centralized and like centralized exchanges, certain things you can regulate, like how many, uh, how much a person can spend or what wallet they're withdrawing to. But the whole crypto in general, how things work, tokenomics, blockchain, mining, things like that uh, will be harder to regulate. Yeah. yeah. And of course, I think, you know, the, the benefit of regulation. In, in some aspect is it brings more people into the space. Yeah, and also to be to be effective uh, on banning, you need to do it worldwide. You need to synchronize all the jurisdictions worldwide to to ban this thing. And we see with COVID that uh, governments are not very good in synchronization and in passing like the same laws everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Pretty much impossible to do, I think. Yeah. Okay, 
So I just want to say a big thank you to John, who will be back with us next week, and to yeah. Alex from Geneva. Uh, your technical insight and views were absolutely superb. Uh, we will be joined by another crypto god next week, and we look forward to seeing you on the show. Bye for now.